welcome, 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 welcome. We back, baby. We back in the studio. Welcome to another exciting rhetoric debate argumentation lecture here today. I'm so happy to be with you, although I look a little washed out, people. What's going on? Why do I look a little washed out? What's going on with you? Hello. I should adjust the lights, you know? It's like winter is coming. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here for another great... Oh, that looks a little bit better. Let me know about the lighting in the comments, of course. Hello, welcome back. Today, we are talking about research in this short lecture. Research today. Uh, Everybody's favorite topic. (coughs) Everybody loves talking about research and uh, how it works. And uh, this video is just going to be a how-to. Very short. Very mindful. Very demure. Oh, a video about source citation. And you might think, well, source citation, kind of annoying. Not for me. Well, let me show you a little something. Let me show you a little something here. Eh, a little something that you might find interesting, uh, which is a short little uh, thing about what I think source citation is, which I call source transparency. Now, I don't like the idea of citation, Oh, and I think it's weird for a professor to say that or a scholar to say that. Uh, Here's why. I think that uh, citation, the way it's commonly taught, makes us think that we've done what we need to do for our readers or our listeners, those idiots, uh, by just simply uh, giving them the site. And they're like, look, I did the research, you know. It's just like one step up from the Internet's. uh, claim of like, well, I can't do, I can't do your research for you. <laughs> do your own research, figure out, you know, do your own research. I can, they'll, they'll make an argument and then people will be like, what about this, this? Like, bro, I don't have time for this. You have to do your own research. And, and I think it's just one step up from that. It's like one scholarly step up from that. And it's kind of pathetic. Uh, when we offer research, what we are doing is we're not offering the truth. We're offering information to our audience that shows that we care about them. We care about how they think and we care about how they reach the decisions they make. Source transparency communicates that caring. It's a rhetorical move to show, I care about you enough to have gone into the depths of this and I found the information that you, aside from how you feel about me, I care about you enough to where this is the information that you need to base your claim on. You need to base your understanding of the world upon this information. I've done the work for you. It's not, I've done my research for you, which is some kind of like moral or ethical imposition, but it's more that I've provided you the path and I've provided you those beautiful things to help you out. So what do I mean by source transparency? Well, there's different levels to providing sources. Uh, Most of the time, we hear people say, according to research, or scientists say, or research indicates, no, that's wrong, that's bad source transparency because it's opaque, it's not transparent at all, it's opaque. I don't know what scientist you're talking about. I don't know what research you're talking about. You have to give me a little bit more or I'm gonna fight you. Uh, There has to be more than that, there has to be more. So there's different levels of doing this. One is, according to source information, Now, you could do that. You can say, according to the New York Times, according to the Washington Post, according to the Journal of Communication Research, or according to communication monographs, but that doesn't provide enough to show that you care. It just says, I've read something more complicated than you have. It's not enough. It's kind of egocentric, egotistical way of presenting evidence. And this is the way evidence is often thought about is, look how much smarter than uh, you I am. Look how much I know more than you. And this is the wrong way to approach it if rhetoric, argumentation, debate, whatever it is that you're watching this video for to improve, it's about making connections. And those connections are the places where people start to really move around. Brain plasticity and narrative plasticity is rooted in the idea 
that one would want to change one's perspective because you're motivated to. It's about narratives. Where's the connected material to narrative if I'm just telling you, hey, there's this information and if you don't get it, you're dumb? What then? Maybe that's why uh, Maybe that's why we have the kind of political conversations we have in our country, huh? Toasty! I don't know. But uh, could you imagine if, like, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris were like, well, according to this research, and they, they specified it? <laughs> I mean, I, can't, I don't know. I, that would be such a weird campaign. But for us, we have to do this because democracy happen, happens at our level, the individual level, the, the level of us. And so I think when we're doing it, we have to show and practice these beautiful kinds of things. So that, the first level is okay, basic, C minus. The next one, according to research publication mentioned in source information. Now that's the good template for most of you. I think this is the one where you're going to do most of your source transparency. Why is this more transparent than number one? Because instead of saying the New York Times, I say, according to a study conducted by researchers at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, mentioned in the New York Times, blah, 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 having eight cups of coffee a day is incredibly healthy. <laughs> that's that's fake. That's not, oh. that's not real information. <coughs> that's me wishful. That's my wishful thinking. <laughs> um, uh, according to, now here's the deepest level. According to researcher, and then you talk about their qualifications. In debate, we call it quals. So you watch an intercollegiate debate, someone has to be like, what's the quals on the author of your card or your evidence? What's the quals? Okay. Why should we listen to them? What is their, <clears throat> what is the reason why they are an expert or an authority figure? And qualifications doesn't mean a degree. It could be life experience. There's lots of people who are totally worth listening to who have life experience, who don't have an advanced degree, and they would be totally worth uh, citing too. So this is where you really blow the minds of your audience, your instructor, your teacher, your uncle, we say, well, according to research conducted by Dr. John Smith from Johns Hopkins, in their publication, uh, a study of the effects of daily coffee drinker on cancer uh, reduction or cancer prevention, they determined that eight cups of coffee a day is good for preventing cancer. And I found all this out in the Washington Post. Now, the other advantage of this that you can see is that a lot of times our politics and our political ideology interfere in our ability to get information across to each other. For example, if I just said, well, I was reading the Washington Post you know, drunk Uncle uh, Bill is going to, oh, the Washington Post, Bezos and the liberals, and da, da, oh, the New York Times, the failing New York Times, oh, the liberals. You know, we've already been pre-coded by people, uh, the plutocrats, who it's to their advantage to have us fighting over this nonsense um, because then they can just continue to steal from us um, <laughs> like, they, like they like to do. So the plutocrats want us fighting about this kind of thing. This is a good way to avoid that kind of ideological claim that your source is liberal or conservative. Oh, I saw it on Fox News. Oh, I saw it from Dr. John Smith on Johns Hopkins who was interviewed in a Fox News report. Oh, Fox News. You might have to deal with it a little bit. But I think that it helps quite a bit. So here are the rules for source transparency. And then we're going to do a little exercise together. Find the report that was cited the article and directly use it. Look up other things the author researcher has done. This saves you research time. Are you frustrated by how much time research takes? Oh. This is the great way to do it. We call it following the breadcrumb trail, and professional researchers do this all the time. You'll find a citation in a book. You'll be like, huh, that's great. You go and look in the library or look on Google or wherever you're researching, and you find other things that person has written. That stuff becomes evidence for your speech, your argument, your debate as well. So it starts to compound and compound and come out. And pretty soon, a small leak, you chisel away at it, you have a flood coming in and look for other research that is cited by that researcher. So let's say you're reading something, you find an interesting uh, site, you go look at it, then you can look at their bibliography and go from there. I've learned so much in my life just from this simple activity of looking at the citations and going and looking those things up. It expands what I'm able to say that's based on external information, not just how the, how the audience or the judge or the teacher feels about me is irrelevant because I bring in all these other voices, all these other perspectives, all these other people I bring in. And so it doesn't really matter what they think of me anymore. What really, really matters is that uh, I have think people backing me up. So it's not just my opinion anymore. We avoid the critique of the dude. Oh, that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> 
You know, uh, I don't know if you guys like that big Lebowski movie. I've never really understood it. I mean, you know. Oh. Uh, lots of people love it, but um, people seem to like it, so I bring it up once in a while. All right. Exercise time. Let's do it, baby. Uh, I am looking at a book here. Let's say I'm researching for a debate or speech on cyberbullying, a very popular topic. Uh, people tend to really like talking about this, about social media. So I found a book here in the university database. I'm not sure what university you're on. I found this in Project Muse, Protecting Children Online, a book by Tiana Milosevic. Uh, Milosevic. I think that's probably how you say it. T uh, Tiana Milosevic is a media scholar and a media researcher from MIT Press. So this is a very good source. And then I was reading along and I found something that could be a good piece of evidence for a speech or for a debate argument, right here. Look at this definition of bullying, that's great. And it's from Mishnah 2012. Now you see this citation here is what you'd expect from academic citation. Let me zoom in on that, because this is, as you recognize it immediately, um, APA citation, uh, American Psychological Association citation. One of the most popular citation formats in the world. Lots of things are in APA and it looks like MIT Press uh, demands uh, uh, APA from its authors as well, uh, or maybe the author uh, thought this would work better. It's interesting because it puts the source right in the middle of the conversation. It's right there in parentheses. So when you're reading, this is great because it doesn't really interrupt your train of thought. Interested enough to say, okay, I've got a source behind this that you can go look up. You can find it if you need to. The point of having a source citation is so that the audience can go double check it and it shows that you have nothing to hide. Now, if this is a speech, we're doing this as a debate argument or a speech in class or for an online class, recording a speech, you can't just say parentheses, Mishnah 2012 parentheses. It doesn't sound good and it disrupts your ability to, it actually harms your credibility in, a, in one of the ironies of it to, to say, well, why do you have to keep stopping to say your sources? Are you that uh, incompetent? Are you not confident that you're right? What's wrong with you? So we have to figure out another way to do it. That's why I put the PowerPoint up. Uh, we can go back and look at real quick where I have these um, these little, uh, I guess you would call them templates for it. And you can look at those templates and uh, use those or even make up your own that go with your pattern of speaking that you find to be invitational and connection building, which is the purpose of offering arguments. It's not to be right and to dominate others or to prove that you're smart. The purpose is to make connections with other people for the better moving of the world. To paraphrase Francis Bacon, who thought rhetoric was reason applied to the imagination for the better moving of the will. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? Uh, well, Mishnah 2012. So here's the things I would do. First of all, I could quote this as a top, I say, according to the author of the book, but that wouldn't be honest. I could say, um, well, the definition of cyberbullying we're getting is from the book Protecting Children Online by uh, Tiana Milosevic. That is not accurate. She put it in there, but it's not as accurate as it could be, and some people might have an issue with you doing it like that. That's not accurate. That's not being transparent with your source. This is actually Mishnah's definition. So we have to immediately move to level two. According to Mishnah, I don't know Mishnah's first name yet, but I'm going to find out. <clears throat> Mishnah, the definition of bullying is aggressive, typically repetitive behavior among school-aged children that intends to evolve for real or perceived power imbalance. This is quoted in Protecting Children Online by Milosevic. Now you see how I'm transparent about where I found it. That doesn't discredit me. It doesn't call me a bad researcher. That indicates that I'm a good researcher, <coughs> a really good oh. researcher. Um it indicates I didn't cut corners. <coughs> Cutting corners would be to claim that this is the definition of the book. Now, Milosevic agrees with this definition, or else it wouldn't be in her book. But let's go a little deeper. Let's see what we can find out here. We have to go to the works cited. Every book has the works cited. Look at all the sites that you have to put in if you write a book. Ooh, intimidating, huh? Yeah, we don't really, I mean, this is like making you not want to write a book, I'm, I'm sure. Toasty! A lot of work. Uh, it's going to take me a minute to find it. Mish, mishka, mishka. Uh, 
uh, citing herself. Very good. Oh, Mishnah. Here it is. Mishnah F. 2012 Bullying, a Guide to Research, Intervention, and Prevention from Oxford University Press. Now that we know the book title, we know Mishnah has written a book about bullying, we can go to our library database. In this case, I'm using St. John's, one of, the, one of the places I work. I'm going to search for Mishnah Bullying and see what comes up. Now over here, I don't know about your um, library, but I can reduce it to books if I want. So let's see if that book comes up. It does not. Okay. And none of these books have her as the author, but look, she's in there. Faye Mishnah. Trauma of Bullying Experiences in the Trauma Contemporary Directions in Theory. Now, this might be good because what if I wanted to talk about the trauma that social media um, creates for students? What if I wanted to talk about that? What if I wanted to, I have to do a little security check here. Uh, what if I wanted to talk about that? Well, here I have this and I can look and it's like the same, the same author. All I have to do is look at the contents page here. Yes, 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 cookies. Toasty! Why are books offering me cookies? <laughs> do I look like I need a cookie? I don't think so. I look like I look like I like cookies. <laughs> um, we'll look through the uh, through the uh, table of contents here. We'll see if we see uh, her. There, Faye Mishnah, chapter 8, 150. So we'll click on chapter 8, and here we are. Now we have more quotes that we can use from Mishnah about trauma and bullying. That expands our ability to argue. That expands our ability to make supported claims. And look at all the sites here, also in APA style. Now I can go to, I think, since this is an edited book, my guess would be the citations are at the end of the article. In an edited book, the citations might be at the end of the article, or they could be at the end of the book, but I always check first since this is an edited book and each, each each people are a different chapter. They might put their references at the end of the chapter. And sure enough, I was right. Yeah. Here are all the references you need right there. Uh, so then you can look up and then you can do the same thing. You can be like, oh, this looks cool. The impact of direct and indirect bullying on the mental and physical health of Italian youngsters in a journal called Aggressive Behavior. Toasty. That would be cool to look up. Like, you learn so much by doing this. You learn so much by doing this this way. And you also make your research job easy. The research does itself. You don't have to do very much at all. It does itself. Because you're following that breadcrumb trail and you're trying to be as open as possible about where the information comes from. And that's what I mean by source transparency. And that's what I want you to practice in your life, in this class, in every research, every argument you have, every debate you do, every speech you give, practice source transparency. You'll find it to be an easier way to research than uh, wandering through the library or through the digital databases looking for information. I gotta go. That's all the time we have for this one. Thank you so, so much for paying attention. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.